Welcome to one of our next to last week. The policy about speaking is enforced as of now. Okay? So, what was the topic? I put the, I put the items on Blackboard and Facebook for those of you who weren't here or weren't paying attention on Tuesday. What were the four topic areas? Okay, O E R trains, or let's call it railroad from now on, just to keep that straight from the organization. Railroad, everybody from now on knows that RR stands for railroad, right? Okay. What else? The politics of extractive industry and. The centennial. So the abbreviation for centennial, I'll just write it here, centennial, is we're going to abbreviate that with just 100, right? Okay, you got that? Okay. The centennial or the 100th anniversary, 100th commemoration of the Armenian Genocide. So what were the three questions I gave you? Because a lot of you wrote just what I said in class. You just regurgitated the notes you had taken during the class. What were the three questions that I posed that you were supposed to then apply to one of these three topic areas? Can you be 100% ethical? Now, writing yes is not enough. Or no, for that matter. So, I, w I expected a justification. Second one, second question. Skills. Now, what did I mean by that? We've talked about this in relationship to which theory, where you talked about training your ethical skills. Exercising moral courage by... Who, who wrote, who wrote es Exercising Moral Courage? <laughs> Linda Hill, bravo, okay. Should I, put the, should I put the authors and their articles on the test to make sure you at least know the titles of the things you didn't read? Okay, as a test question, you'd like that, wouldn't you? Okay, the third one. Personal change. Now, the question was, of course, is that a prerequisite? What I want to do today is to go over this, this, these three steps with respect to CSR and IFC. C, S, R, and I of C. Okay, CSR, if you look, if you Google it, really doesn't catch on, doesn't become part of mainstream thinking until the 90s. Now, elements of CSR have existed for a very long time. Uh, but what is the core difference between CSR and charity? CSR and paternalism or CSR and philanthropy? All three of them are examples of leaders being nice guys, or nice girls for that matter. But what's the big difference? Uh, what, what was the last part? In their core area of activity. This is essential. Because giving charity to the missed, the unfortunate, the, those who have not succeeded like you have, is as old as we are, as a species. Ever since we've been created by God the way we are right now, or we've evolved, we evolved into who we are, whichever theory you, you support, ever since we've become human beings, we have a tendency to help the poor, to help the unfortunate. This is often referred to as altruism. Altruism is a deontological concept. 
What do I mean by that? Mm, that's the big difference between deontological and universalist, okay? What? What does deontological mean? Bravo. We do something irrespective of the consequences, which means we do good because it's the right thing to do. We might not get rewarded. We might actually get punished for doing the right thing. We'll do it anyway. What does Zimbardo call these people who do the right thing no matter what, even in the faces of incredible odds? They refuse to do the wrong thing. They refuse to be spoiled by the bad apples or the bad apple barrel makers. He calls, them, he calls it heroic behavior. It's just one of the categorizations that we now know. Uh, he calls it heroic because there are so few. He's interested in evil traps. And he's studying people who, in situations where it's highly unlikely that they'll do the right thing, do it anyway. So altruism assumes that I do something because it's right. Now, what is the usual, or historically speaking, the last, if we take the overview of the last, let's say, six, seven thousand years, what was the main reason why people did good things? Religion. Religion. This is very important. Religion does not mean irrational, but it does mean that the justification is not to be sought through thinking through something logically, but looking for divine inspiration, which means the right thing to do is handed to you, prepackaged, if you will, by a book or a religious leader, a sheikh, a priest, rabbi, whatever. So this is not what we're talking about with CSR, because that's, that's basically part of being human. Altruistic behavior is, you could say, part of what makes us a, 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 the species a homo sapien. So it's not that. CSR is linked to the core activity of an organization. So if you're a leader in an organization, and here again we have three types of this is political science class, so we have different categories than you're probably used to. Three types of activity in society. What are they? As far as organizations that run things are concerned. We have the public sector, which in political science means the government. It doesn't really matter what kind of government, whether it's democratic or undemocratic, whether it's a kingdom or a, a theocracy, a, relig a religious state, whatever. So public sector? Private sector is the for-profit sector, businesses, where you're probably, most of you are going to end up. And civil society. So in all three sectors, we have uh, the issue, what is the core activity? If you look at the step from altruism, which is deontological, means you do it because it's right, not because of rewards, to the core activity, what's happening is when you have a, if you just want to say that's your, that's your organization, if you want to practice charity, you have money, you give the money to some needy group, and that's it. They might use some of the money to buy your products, but there's no feedback. Philanthropy, sponsorship, similar. I mean, it's, these are, sponsorship is part of a marketing strategy, it's very straightforward. We're sponsoring this event, we're sponsoring this organization because we want advertising. Philanthropy can be more long-term, for example, we support museums, we support theaters, because it's generally good for society to have educated and cultured populations. Paternalism, on the other hand, is within the institution. It's the fatherly leader. Understood? Remember, remember these categories? The idea that the, the, the NDU is, for example, a typical uh, paternalistic institution. The idea that the leadership has a fatherly responsibility for us. And they even go as far as calling us a family. NDU is a family. This expresses this uh, paternalistic mindset, which is very strong in many 
different religions, and of course very strong in Catholicism. It's within the institution. What happens when you do CSR? You're working in your core area, so the assumption is that it's going to go back and forth. You're taking your core area, let's say, um, let's take the marathon. Uh, let, let's, take, let's take football, because everybody's talking about that now. Uh, I see a lot of cars with Lebanese flags on, like Brazil and Lebanon. I didn't know Lebanon qualified for the World Cup. <laughs> so let, let's, say, let's say you wanted to have a Lebanese team. Let's say in, let's set a goal. Yeah, it's, uh, not like Qatar, you're not going to buy it, right? You're gonna, but let's say within 12 years we want Lebanon like like the Ivory Coast, for example. If the Ivory Coast can make it to the finals, <laughs> why not Lebanon, right? So, if you set a goal for, Leban for the Lebanese national football team to make it to the World Cup, which companies or which organizations would see this as their CSR responsibility or activity? Which organizations could play a role here? Banks. Why banks? Because money rolls or what? Okay, sports organizations, anybody who's directly related in, in the field of sports, for example, organizations that merchandise sports uh, in Lebanon, in Lebanon. So does Adidas have a, have a, a Lebanese office? Okay, Adidas Lebanon. The, the sports companies like Decathlon and Mike's, Mike's used to be one of the uh, uh, sponsors of the marathon. Uh, so. Sporting goods, in general. What else? Budweiser? Uh, I don't think so. Why would Budweiser, why would the consumption of beer encourage your athletic ability? That's sponsorship, it's not CSR. This is the, this is the point. A brewery cannot, <laughs> A brewery can be, if, if, a, if a brewery, okay, seriously now, question. If, what could a brewery do with respect to CSR? One of my, one of my favorite engineers is a guy by the name of George Shaheen. He works at, for Strumpf, or Schrumpf, or whatever you call it, right? Uh, and they sell beer. They, they, they now have German beer, they have lots of German beer, they now even have Wiener Schnitzel or the Escalop Viennoise made of pork to make it real German, right? I think they're the first. Anyway, what's the point? Bre breweries, how could they practice CSR? Plant uh, wine the What could a brewery do to encourage social development? That's not development. That's, so a beer festival would be, would be sponsorship or would be just direct marketing. No, think, think guys. What, would, what, would, what could a brewery do? Beside, besides, for example, having uh, awareness raising campaigns about not abusing alcohol, they could, support, they could support Alcoholics Anonymous, but that probably wouldn't be a good uh, association with the brewery. But what could they do, seriously? Okay, what are, what, what are the negative, besides alcoholism, what are the negative aspects of the beverage industry? I said beside alcoholism, and I said beverage industry. Water's not healthy? Yeah. Think about it. What, what, what does the beverage industry cause for social problems? What kind of social... Pollution, bravo. Pollution mainly in the form of waste. So what could you do as a brewery? You could reintroduce recycling bottles, for example. You could... Whatever. So you could work in the area of waste and pollution. This would have a direct impact on the company. If a, the idea of CSR is that the leaders 
get their own organization involved in the improvements. So, I just happened to know a, a, a brewer, somebody who did a CSR program for a brewery in Salzburg, in case you're interested, it's called <laughs> Stiegel Breu. No, it's with an E. Stiegel. Stiegelbräu, right? It's, it's, it's one of the world's oldest breweries. It was founded in 1492. So, of course, their premium beer is called Columbus. Uh, that's a coincidence. Okay, so what, one of the things that Stiegelbräu did was to have a massive campaign against waste related to not only personal consumption of of all beverages, because mo many breweries are part of beverage companies, but also in the catering industry, in the, in the industry, restaurants, cafeterias and schools and hospitals, whatever, they have huge amounts of waste. So a brewery could, for example, fight excessive consumption and waste in the entire catering industry. That would be CSR. See the difference? It would, they would have to change, they would have to get their customers to change, their individual customers and their wholesale customers, and what else would they do? Remember the thumbnail, the thumb print video. Who else could they impact beside their customers and their selves? Their suppliers. Very important, suppliers. If you're a big company, or even a medium-sized company, your suppliers are your prisoners. They need you, and you can dictate ethical behavior to them to a certain extent. Okay, is that, is that clear? So, now what I want to show you is something that I don't think a lot of you got, is the link between 100% and personal change. I didn't see many people get that right. To be 100% ethical and if I ask this question on the, on the, on the, ne on the test, the third test, 100% uh, ethical means 100%, means zero errors. You all know how easy it is to quit smoking. It's very easy to quit smoking. It's very difficult to stay quit. I quit eight times. The eighth time worked, okay. so. It's really about errors more than being a good person or a bad person. So it's very strongly here about skills. This is what Linda Hill, I was hoping that some of you would, in the, that 10 minute pop quiz we had, think about some things that we had talked about. S ethical skills are not skills on how to run a railroad, skills on how to run the oil industry, skills on uh, how to, to deal with information technology, their skills on how to avoid, if you're 100% ethical, what are you, according to Kohlberg? Post you're post-conventional. Kohlberg would say, well, once you reach post-conventional, you're, you're, you've arrived, right? Rest would say, you, you can go back. So this is where Rest agrees with Hammerskjold. They're both and a lot of the others are, most of the skills that we've read about, what, what is the most important skill that we, I've kept on pointing out to all of you that so many different thinkers with a variety of names have suggested if you want to be a, an ethical leader? Quiet time. Quiet time. Or inner dialogue, Hammerskjold. Or solitudine. Hill, or Martin Luther King, from Anita Hill, Linda Hill, excuse me, from Linda Hill, but in the article from Linda Hill, right? But it's from Franco Barnabe, thank you for correcting me there, yes? Uh, I'm not going to answer that question, that's up to you. There are people who, who claimed, for those of you who came to class a week ago, who claims that his, he and his company forget his name now myself, but which company 100% ethical? The Thumbprints printing company in Malaysia. For those of you who didn't see the video, ask your friends, did anybody actually film it with their, 
I saw some of you, did you, did I, did most of you stopped in the middle somehow. You stopped in the middle, right, unfortunately. Uh, I'd like to get a, um, a copy of that that has its subtitles, point one, uh, but videos like that are not e easily, easily put on the web. We'd have to get a, we'd have to get a YouTube version of that uh, uh, uploaded. Okay, the important thing here is the, the personal skills. Actually, this list goes backwards. What, does, what is the point that the president or the CEO of Thumbprints make at the beginning of the film? Before he says anything about how his company has become 100% ethical, personal change. And he, I mean, this is, not, this is not the only way, and I, he makes this point, this is not something he's prescribing for everyone, but for him it's a religious conversion. And we don't know from the... I'm going to have to ask whether he was not Christian and became Christian or whether he was Christian and was simply following the rituals and now decided to become a real one. Does everybody understand what I mean by that? A ritual Christian as opposed to a committed practicing Christian? Does, every, does anybody not? Should I explain that? It's okay. I mean, think about it. For those of you who don't believe in God, there's always a couple in the class. Uh, what do you have to do to make your parents happy? if you're Christian. How many times do you have to go to church? Once. Christmas? Easter? Easter. Twice, on Easter. Twice on East Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, that's three times. How many more times? Maybe there'll be a baptism or a funeral that you have to go to. A wedding. We're, a wedding, okay, we're talking about under 10 times a year max. And your parents are happy. They're happy, right. That's a ritual Christian. You can have the same thing in Islam or any other religion, as opposed to a practicing. What he's talking about is personal change. Now, that means there's an inner conviction to change the way you run things altogether. This can be based on faith. This can be based on rational thinking. My experience is it's much, much easier with faith, but there's plenty of people who've done it based on a rational approach. So this is actually the first step. What is the first step that, for the, we brought up the issue of Alcoholics Anonymous. Initiatives of change, of change, what am I doing here, IFC. Initiatives of change, members founded Alcoholics Anonymous. What's the first thing you do when you want to stop being an alcoholic? You have to admit you're an alcoholic. So you go, hi, my name is Bob and I'm an alcoholic. So basically, if we want to repackage that, you have to say, hi, my name is Bob, and I'm unethical. And I, or, I, mean, I actually did this once at a conference on corruption. I mentioned that IFC, had, IFC members had founded AA, and then I got up and I said, hi, my name is Eugene, and I'm corrupt. <laughs> they said, hi, Eugene, and they all applauded. Yeah, okay. Because <laughs> they had to admit, no, no, that's it. But I actually did that, and had a, it, it really sunk in. Uh, because if you're in a leadership position, you, personally, I haven't been able to reach that level yet of 100% uh, ethical. Because, we'll go into that in a second. The, 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 the second thing, before, after you make the decision, for whatever reason, and this is, where, if you look historically, the religious institutions have had a better track record, the religious movements, people who, whose activities are based on faith, although it doesn't have to be that way. So, the next thing is, once you've made that personal decision, you work on skills. As you said, it's mistakes. It's not, oh, I'm a bad person. What does, what does Linda Hill say? If, you, if, you, if you would, could we combine Linda Hill and rest, Linda Hill says you have to exercise. When you exercise as an athlete, what do you develop besides your stamina, your lungs, your heart, your muscles? Your skills. When you start playing tennis, how many of you are, are consider yourselves good at tennis? I'm not one of them. Anybody good at tennis? Okay, good at table tennis, same principle. When you start playing table tennis, at the very beginning, what do you look at? Your, your palate, right? You're always looking, uh, 
Uh, later on, you graduate to actually look at the ball, right? After a while, when you're really good, who do you look at? When the ball's coming at you, who are you looking at? The other guy, right? I don't care. I know by now how the ball comes at me. I see it coming, right? I don't have to look at the ball anymore. I'm looking at what he's up to. You don't need to look at your hand. You don't have to look at the palate. You don't need to look at the ball. You look at the actual thing of interest. So when you practice your ethical skills, you focus on the core question, which is not your hand or the racket or the palate or the ball, but it's that thing that you're trying to defeat. In this case, unethical activities. So you need to develop skills. One of the skills that I sort of hammered into you until everybody hopefully got it is some sort of quiet time. Most leadership organizations, most leadership and training uh, schemes focus on this. And it's something you need to, need to do with athletic discipline. Anybody who's any good at sports knows that the moment you stop training every day, if you're really into sports, which day do you usually not train? The game's on Sunday, so which day do you not train? Saturday. Saturday's a day you rest and you know, build up your reserves because you've been training all week. From Monday to Friday, you've been really out there training. Saturday, you just relax. So on Sunday, you're full of drive and you're, you, it's build up, you have a lot of build up energy now because for a full day you haven't been, been able to get rid of your t build up energy. I remember we talked about tension. Tension is a form of stored power. So, that, so anybody who's, who's in sports, they know that when they haven't trained for a day or two, they're like really, ooh, I gotta get out there and let it, let it, let it loose. Okay, good. So quiet time is one of them. What did thumbprints recommend otherwise for some of the skills, the techniques? The first one, what do you know when you stop, what's going to happen when you stop bribing government officials? They're going to do what? They're going to reject all of your applications. Your, your, your trucks, if you have a company, your trucks will have to be inspected on a regular basis. They will turn your trucks down out of principle because you're not bribing them. Water, electricity, sewage, uh, if they have to do an inspection of the structures of your buildings. Insurance companies do the same thing, by the way. All of those inspections, you can count on them, on this, as the sun rises in the morning, you are going to fail. So what do you do? You go back to bribing, right, okay, good. That's the one option, that means 100% doesn't work. Okay, if you don't want to bribe, look, the, the person who comes, let's say you have a natural gas in your factory. Once a year in most countries who have this, the government official comes and looks at your gas system and inspects it, and if it's fine, you get a seal of approval, you might have to pay a certain fee because of the inspection costs money, and the guy moves on. If, if it's a, a system based on rule of law, that's all you pay him. You're not even allowed to invite him to lunch. He won't, he'll have to say no. In a culture of impunity, he expects with the papers some money. Whatever, right. So. A lot, of, a, a lot of the, this is why I gave you the handout, because these are examples primarily from Asia, countries that have a very similar culture of impunity as does Lebanon. India, Malaysia are the two examples that we've had so far. One skill that you can count on, or you should, you should use is, you can count on them turning down your application. So when you take your trucks, what does is, what is the owner of Thumbprints do? He has, when it comes inspection time, he rents additional trucks. So when they turn him down and say, you have to repair that, that, and that, you, once you do that, they have to accept you, right? But it's going to take like two days. So what does he do? He has a truck rented to fill in for those two days. Does that cost money? Yeah, yeah. so it costs something. It's not free. When you go for 
a, a renewal of a permit for whatever you're doing, and you're not going to bribe, what are they going to do? They're going to turn you down. First of all, they're going to take time to deal with it, and then they're going to turn you down. So what do you do? You go, you, you go ahead of time, and you submit ahead of time. You know that they're going to do all kinds, use all kinds of tricks to make your life miserable. And you document everything. What is, a, what is a way of documenting something? By the way, this is a very interesting, if you, if you need to go to court, you go to a government official, everything's off the record. He says, no bribe, okay, well, come back tomorrow, you come back tomorrow, this keeps on going. Every time you go to the government official, write a protocol, write, a, write minutes, put it in a sealed envelope, send it registered mail to yourself, and don't open it. It'll be a form of proof because you'll have five or six letters that you wrote to yourself. Now this is your word against his, but this, these are six month old letters and they're all consistent. This person, the problem with lying is you have to have a really good memory. And this guy probably doesn't. And he'll catch, he'll get caught in contradictions whereas you'll have these four or five documents. This is one of the ways of doing it. But what he, he recommends is go ahead of time, build in extra time, and the second he goes over time, lodge a complaint with his superiors. And if you don't get satisfaction with his superior, lodge a complaint against that person's superior. You've all, you're already screwed, right? He's already not dealing with your application. Somewhere up that line, there'll be somebody who doesn't like that guy. And they'll use that against him, and he knows it. So it's only a matter of time until he gives up. The only reason these skills work is because, and he points this out in the video, you've not done anything that he can use against you. The moment you start, let's say if you, on, on, on the big issues you don't bribe, but on the small issues you bribe, because it's not worth my while. What is the person on the big issue gonna do? He's gonna try to find out, I mean, in, in Lebanon, I'm assuming that all of you know that everybody is somehow breaking the rules. Somewhere, somehow, right? So, if I go and catch somebody breaking the rules against me and I start you know, going on the bandwagon there, you know, complaining about this person's behavior, what's that person immediately going to do to defend himself? Look for the dirt on my record, right? So the only way to actually succeed is to have a clean record, okay. So, what is this actually called here? Is this called CSR? No, what's it called? No. It's called, very simple, good, core, poor it, governance. Very simple. Good corporate governance. <laughs> it's what you should all be doing as students. Do the right thing. Good corporate governance is not about anything that people outside of your institution will notice immediately. If you apply good governance to yourself, nobody is going to notice at first. Whether you're a leader or a follower, let's say you, so one of your friends starts becoming very honest, starts becoming very diligent, does their homework all the time. Maybe they won't have as much time to go out and party, that, you might notice that, but otherwise, most people around them are not going to really see any change at first. The change becomes evident later on. This is what, if you will, is the key component of personal change. Personal change, when linked to CSR, has a very Interesting effect. Does anybody know, I'm sure you have heard this, the famous Gandhi quote, be the change you want to see in the world. What does that actually mean? Right. Start very simply with personal change, and this is a skill for, for leaders, a leadership skill. Start 
with quiet time, with whatever, start working on your skills. Now, the problem is that if you only have personal change and you don't, the point is be the change. Second step is you want to see in the world. So ultimately, this has to be applied outside of your organization. So if the leader of an organization becomes a changed person and gradually the organization starts changing, you have to find a way of getting outside of the box. And this is where CSR comes in. CSR is part of your core activity because that's the only way to link it to your own people. If your people are in the beverage industry, that's what they know. So when, they, when the beverage producers go to the restaurants or the cafeterias, they are speaking the same language. They both know what goes into the use of beverages. If you are in the banking sector, a bank can go to its clients. Who besides individuals use banking services? Or financial services. Let's go make it bigger. Financial services. Who besides individual? Corporations. So corporations who produce steel use the financial services of banks. So when you as a bank go to a corporation or any business or individual clients, you know what you're talking about. When you start changing your behavior, are there honest insurance companies? No? You don't think so? Are there honest insurance companies? Yeah, right. So in fine print, yeah. They're, they're, they're normally not breaking the law. But are there ethical insurance companies? Are there any companies who are ethical? Why, why if there are ethical companies, can there not be ethical insurance companies? Right. So, so if you're, if you're in the financial services sector, you would then, if you're going to, going to do CSR, one of the options would be having ethical practices, which would be no fine print, which would be offering, for example, insurance to people who otherwise couldn't get it. Who's, who usually can't get health insurance? I mean, no, who can't get it at all? Those who have pre-existing health conditions, if you, if, if, and old people. And basically, that's when you need it. When do you need health insurance? When you, when you, have, a, when you have a pre-existing health issue or when, you have, when you're old. So CSR would be, for insurance companies, could focus on this issue. Uh, let's take an engineering example, since we have so many engineers, of, of, a, of, a, of a CSR issue. We got two right here. Oil and gas and the railroads. So what I'm going to do now, now you can turn it on, please. And what I'm going to do now is give you an example from the railroad industry. And uh, Milo, I'm going to leave this, leave it on because I want to see how this works. This is, this is all just a experiment anyway, so I want to see how a PowerPoint works uh, with OER, right? <laughs> Normally OER is very choreographed. What does that mean? What is choreography? In theater. Everything is pre pre-planned. So when the person comes on stage, that's exactly when that person says that line. When the dancer starts, the music starts. Choreography. In, 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 in our case, choreography would be that this has all been practiced at least once or twice before. So, good. 
uh, can you turn just the front, the lights off here, and... Uh, okay, let's look now at the issue of the railroads. Uh, that's not what I was... No. Can we have some lights in the back so that I can be seen a little bit? Uh, we can only have the middle? Oh, that's good. Okay, that's good. Okay, good. So, the, can you see me, Milo? Okay. Uh, what are some of the ethical issues we talked about related to the railroads? Well, what is the first and foremost we talked about before? Some of you have it in your notes. No, the first one. E ecology. Ecology. Railroads are much more fuel efficient than trucks and cars, or planes for that matter. So, a, a massive reduction in the use of fuel. How about land use? If you look at the land that railroads use, and the lands that, that highways use, much less, a fraction. So, whether it's waste of land, whether it's waste of energy, how about pollution? Direct air pollution, for example. What, do, what are the two options today for railroads? Electric or, or diesel? Electric or diesel? Electric, ultimately, I mean, considering our options now with renewable energy, Holland has set a goal for the next decade to have its entire train network running on renewables which means that the windmills and the photovoltaic panels that produce the electricity will, be enough, will create enough electricity to run the entire train system, which basically means very close to zero energy use to run the entire train system. So, ecology. Second one. Second ethical issue. Okay, road safety, that's part of the first category. So, the, you do these things because it's good for society, not just good for your own profitability. Second one, maintenance. What is the interesting side of maintenance from an ethical perspective? We just talked about it. When you decide to, do be, to, do, to be good, what's the hard part? Staying with it, not backsliding, not going from post-conventional back to self-interest, or even maintaining norms for that matter. So, by its very nature, railroads require a huge amount of upkeep. Otherwise, they lead to horrible accidents. So, it's, a very, good, uh, it's very good for your character, if you will. If you work, railroad workers are very disciplined people. That's why they were always feared by the conservative parties, because they were usually socialists. And when you have a opposition, do you want your opposition to be highly disciplined or all chaotic and emotional? Which, op which opposition is easier to deal with? A chaotic emotional one that might turn violent even, or one that's highly disciplined? The highly disciplined one's the dangerous one because they, they, they probably will never turn violent because violence is always a bad option when you're opposing power. Because if you turn violent, then they can arrest you. You don't turn violent, they have to find other options. So the railroad workers, historically, were always one of the very interesting labor unions. So, discipline. But of course, discipline with ma maintenance of track, discipline with maintenance of the rolling stock. You have to constantly be looking at the, at the engines. Nothing, nothing can break down. One wheel falls off an, impo an important part of, on the train, and the whole thing collapses. The whole system. There's a wreck. People can get killed. At the very least, you'll have hours of loss as far as the use of the track is concerned, so maintenance. Small, in incremental steps to keep it going. Okay, what else? Speci specifically Lebanese now, we talked about. If you're going to reintroduce the railroad system. Okay, how do you deal with the people who have built, not only built on government property, but build on government property for a profit. It's a big difference. If I build, if I, if I would build, let's say, oh, no, this train hasn't run for 30 years, I need a place for a little getaway vacation cottage on the weekend. That's one thing. Another thing is, 
building a hotel or a shopping center on the government track. That's for a profit. As far as the crime is concerned, that's much greater. So how do we deal with these people who are often our relatives or our local mayor who've built on the government property and are making a profit off of it? Well, this is an important issue because this is, this, if, you, if you could get a grasp on that, you would have a precedent. Remember the term precedent? With a, a precedent does what? It creates a, an example that can be followed in other areas. We could, once, if you could actually deal with the illegal use of the railroad property effectively in a way that everybody's served, I mean, the people who committed the crimes don't have to pay that much, but they have to pay something. The people who are suffering get a restitution. You could then use that as a role model, as an example, for the other areas, like water, like electricity, like the educational system, like the government debt, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so there are, now what about leadership? We have the ethical side now. What about the leadership side? If we're going to go after or set a goal to reintroduce the trains, obviously this is something I'm personally interested in. Uh, if we're going to reintroduce trains in Lebanon, what, which leadership positions would we look at? Who's, who's a leader in this? Of transportation? The Directorate for Railroads. Ziad Nasser. This is his name, if you want to know. <laughs> and he's the, he's the head of the Directorate for Railroads. He's a nice guy, actually. Uh, he's, all, he's getting a little bit uncomfortable now because the NGO is becoming more, becoming better known. Uh, and we have a hotline when people start building on the track, we send in demonstrators and stop it, at least for that time being. So, um, or they try to sell stuff illegally from the, there are three big tra train stations in Lebanon. Does, do you know where they are? Tripoli. Tripoli. Where in Beirut? Mar Michel. And the biggest one, the huge one. In the Bekaa, in which town? Rayak. Riyah. Riyah. Thank you. Riyah. Right. It's spelled in English, Rayak. Anyway, okay. So let's think about the leadership. So it's, it's the Minister of Transportation, the, minister, the, 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 the Directorate for Railroads. Ministers always change, directorates seem to stay pretty stable. Uh, who else? Interestingly enough, there, one of the strategies to get rid of the railroads forever is to turn them, some of them, into parks. So we would not only have the Minister of Transportation, we'd have the Minister of Tourism, who, interestingly enough, Minister Faraon is very keen now on turning some of the railroads into parks because then we can just put them in mothballs and they'll be gone forever. So this is a new strategy. We see this as a, an example of the success of the NGO that they're actually developing counter strategies. Up until an NGO that's totally ineff ineffectual has no enemies because who cares about you? You're a nobody. So it's the fact that they're developing counter strategies is interesting. The, who else could be a leader besides the government ministries? Besides the government in itself. We, the government sector. <laughs> Private sector, obviously. What, what is a normal, if you, if you want to kickstart uh, an infrastructure project, what is normally used? It's called PPP. <laughs> Private, public, partnership. So corporations provide the capital. Once they've got a, re a good return on their initial investment, they're bought out, or they the rest of the pro property is returned to the government, or maybe not, whatever. But the option is always then to go from private par public to fully public, or fully private for that matter. So, industrial leaders. I'll, I'll show you in a moment how, that's, how that works. What about outside of Lebanon? Think, think a little bit bigger now. What is the regional context? Syria, Turkey, yes. Petroleum, Europe, the other direction, the Gulf. Some of you might know that the Gulf states are investing tens of billions of dollars on developing their own railroad network. But not, not just there, but also linking it through 
Iraq and Syria, when that becomes possible, along the same route that they're planning on using for the natural gas pipelines. Both natural gas pipelines, some people even make the argument that the reason there's a war in Syria is because Qatar wants control of Syria so it can control the pipelines. That's a pretty far-fetched explanation, but could play a role. So the natural gas pipelines are going to go from the Gulf through Syria and Iraq, Turkey, Europe. Railroads, same thing. It doesn't make much sense to transport non-perishable freight by ship or truck. It's much more expensive, it's often slower, and it's definitely more damaging to the environment. Air, of course, is even worse. Okay, so these links are going to go through. Inshallah, Lebanon will link on to the natural gas pipeline. I'm assuming that's going to happen. What about the railroad links? Can Lebanon, can Lebanon link on to those? Yes. Yeah. So France has offered, and the EU has offered Lebanon a large sum of money to link the Lebanese railroads onto the future Arab grid. Recently. Yeah. So that's a good job for engineers, by the way, you know, rebuilding the railroads. Imagine that. So engineers among you, let's go. So what is, this, what is an NGO? This is just an example. Non-governmental organization. The, it's a, an eclectic membership. You're all welcome to join. Engineers, there we go, engineers. Uh, architects, professors like myself, filmmakers, photographers. Are these people leaders? Are these people, why isn't this not? What do I have to do here? Where do I push next? I did right click. Do I have to push next each time? With the arrows. With the arrows, oh, with the arrows, okay. Good. Are these people leaders? They're very important. They're leaders in their own domain. So, uh, the mission and objectives is to reintroduce the railroad, to advocate, to raise awareness. The first step, and you've, we've, had, we've done this tw three times at NDU, is to make people aware of the fact that we have a railroad. And I must here thank the Society of Civil Engineers for their wonderful help in helping set up the exhibit, also uh, yesterday for the NGO fair. Uh, next. So, how many of you recognize this map? Yeah, okay. This is the old link. Somehow I don't have my... What? Oh, here it is. Uh, uh, yeah. This is the, er, the first line, 1895, linking... Beirut to Damascus. It goes straight up the mountain. How can, for those of you who know anything about engineering, you know that railroads work because of the friction between the steel wheel and the steel track. And as you increase the incline, what happens? The ratio between friction and inclination becomes less and less desirable until it starts slipping back. Okay, so you, that's why you can't build a train up a hill. So what do you have to do? It's called a cogwheel. Cogwheel is, we'll see it in, the cogwheel is you have a hole and a peg. And it goes to, to, to the cog, the most advanced cogwheel technology in its time was, in, was introduced in Lebanon. In the, 19, in the 1890s, Lebanon had the most advanced alpine railroad system in the world. It was a, an engineering feat which was considered impossible, but it worked in Lebanon. Now this track here, this one along the coast, was built by the Australians and the South Africans in 42. They wanted to link their own um, part of the region, which was Palestine, to what had just been conquered by the British. Who was in charge of Lebanon before, until 42? Adolf Hitler. Yes. <laughs> Through the Vichy government. So, 
that Lebanon was indirectly an ally of the Third Reich. In 42, it was conquered, liberated, whatever you want to call it, by Australian troops. And this rail link was built intending to link the UK with Egypt. It was finished in 43. It took them one year. They did this primarily by tearing up bridges and track in England and bringing them here by ship. That's how you can do it in one year. This, the whole thing was made in one year, from the top, from Tripoli, down to Haifa, the entire link. It's very fast, but it's a war, so you can do things in a war that you can't do otherwise. Obviously here, that's the border to Palestine or Israel, that's a no-go, obviously, but we, we see here with the link to Damascus, now this is the interesting one. The link from Tripoli through Akkar to Homs, and on to Aleppo, if that would, that's by the way fully, completely intact. All you have to do is turn it on. If this rail link would start working again, what effect, effect would it have on Tripoli? A lot of the freight, did you notice what happened in the last couple of years to the Beirut Harbor? This you know, those big cranes now for unloading container ships, it's getting bigger and bigger every month. A lot of that freight would go to Tripoli because in Tripoli they wouldn't have to put it on trucks. In Tripoli they could do what? Put it on rail. And the stuff in those containers is not going to rot, it's not going to spoil. So it doesn't matter whether it goes over to Homs and down to Damascus because actually that's not very fast either. So you, go, you take it here, you take it over here, Homs, down to Damascus, of course we're assuming the war is over, and Tripoli reestablishes itself as the second, truly really the second city and competitor with Beirut. So there are political reasons why we don't want the railroad, right? If you're not from Tripoli, right? <laughs> so what are we doing? We are collecting history of the rails. We've had, we've had various exhibits. I'm not going to go through this in detail. Mainly to make people know that there's a there was a thriving railroad network here and it can come back. I don't know if any of you have seen this exhibit. It was also at NDU, but in a scaled down version. This is at the Betadine Festival, and this is at the Beirut Souks. Uh, it's now at the airport, but it's torn between two departure and two arrival uh, halls, and so it doesn't really work very, very well. But it's there now. And we have the smaller version. Uh, we work with artists. We have talks and debates. This is something that, uh, I mean, we want in the next couple of years to get this actually rolling in, uh, in I'm caught in my microphone. Okay. Uh, guided walks, you can take hikes along the track to get to know things. You can go to the trail, rail stations. We are d interviewing all the old uh, employees. No, this part you don't have to take notes on. Uh, a, a centralized rail archive. This has actually now been promised to us. Ziad Nasser, this is not a secret because he, he told us this publicly. Ziad Nasser has told us that we can have the Mar Michiel, part of the Mar Michiel station for a archive so that all the stuff can be collected because this is one of the first things you do when you want to consolidate a movement is to write its history. Just think about our projects. This is the one. Okay. PPP. Some of you might know these two towns. Jbeil, Petrum. That track is free. You can take old steam engines. Think of, think of the profit here. Take old steam engines and old cars. Make sort of a Orient Express experience out of it and take the tourists and run them up and down that strip, stretch of land. Would that make a lot of money? Yeah. You bet it would. And it would also make a lot of money for Biblos and Batroun, who are, which are already very attractive tourist uh, locations. It would, this would be sort of the link, and that would turn that section right there, which is attractive now because of the relative security as opposed to the south and the Baka, into a, a major tourism hub similar to Betadin and Baalbek. So, is there money in that? Yeah. But what is the, what is the effect of that? If, if that? if that's actually going to run, the track's there. You just have to put the, 
put the trains on the track, it's ready. Okay, what would happen if Lebanese who have guests in the summer uh, would go up and down on that rail with their friends from Uruguay or New Zealand? What would the Lebanese who go on that train experience? They would realize next time that they go from Biblos to Beirut that we really don't have to sit in this traffic for two hours. <laughs> we, could act, we could actually have a train, right? And, and that would be the major mental breakthrough. So, uh, so this, is, this is the project that we're working on. This is still in the planning phase. Uh, this, as I said, this, this is not, we now have from, the, uh, from Ziad Nasa, we now have the, the green light, the yes, to start with this archive project, which is just to save the history in the Mar Michiel. You know where that is, that's an extension of, uh, of uh, you know where it is, right? The extension of, uh, uh, what's the name, where Paul's is that, what's that name, part of Beirut? It's not Ashrafia, it's, the first part of it. Jemaisi, it's Jemaisi, it's, it's, the, it's the extension of Jemaisi Street, right, okay, for those of you who don't know it. Okay, uh, this, is, this is actually now going to happen. So if anybody's interested in the history of trains, you could work with us on that. This is the big one. This is a huge, has anybody seen it? Huge train station. It's as big as any train station you can see in Europe. And it's in the Bacca, and nobody knows about it. So. Here is to turn this into an industrial park and a museum, and part of it should be revitalized. So we have an NGO there, and I went there last summer with my daughter. <laughs> Some of you met her, right, you know, you put a little personal touch in there. Okay, good, can you turn the lights back on? Can someone put up the, uh, and turn on the lights again, please. Good, okay, now what's the ethics and leadership uh, aspect of this? This was a very nice colorful presentation. How is it linked to ethical leadership? What aspects, what, or what's gonna have to happen? I mean, your, what's your first response when you see this and you see these claims that we're going to, uh, if possible, you can turn that off too. Um, that we're going to do, what, 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 what's the, the most logical response for anybody who's grown up in Lebanon? That's never going to happen. That's never going to, no, that's never going to work. Why is, it, why is it not going to work? The government is not a thing. The government is made up of what? Politicians, who are actually people, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> They're actually people, they have lives, right? And they can actually change. How do you get change? I mean, a lot of you say, well, you know, the problem in Lebanon is the government, the, the infrastructure, the institutions. They have to change, and then, we'll, then the country will be okay. Does that work for you? I've been waiting for 15 years since I've moved here, and it hasn't actually changed. What can you change yourself? Bravo. Now, let's bring in good old Martin Luther King in the last five minutes. So, if we are going to go and put pressure on good old Ziad Nasser, and if you want to join us, he's a nice guy, he's a nice guy, but he's, he's not, he doesn't have very many friends who are helping him in his mission. He's relatively new in his job as well. If we're gonna go out and fight for the railroads, According to Martin Luther King, what's the first thing we have to do? Research. Research, which is basically know everything about the trains in Lebanon and everything about reconstructing train systems that have been abandoned, dealing with government corruption, and on the other end of the food chain, modern, state-of-the-art, cutting-edge technology. Because if we're going to rebuild the railroad system in Lebanon, why? repair the old stuff, why not, for example, the, the link between Lebanon, between Beirut and Damascus, why not build something that's absolutely modern? 
as modern as they're building in Dubai. This is not good news, but it's, it's, it's coincidentally convenient. A lot of the rail system in Syria has been destroyed during the war. So what does that mean? They're very, they had a very wonderful railroad system, by the way, in Syria. I've gone on it many times. So now that it's destroyed, what do they have to do? So I don't know if I'm going to make any friends with this suggestion, but why not integrate the reconstruction of the Lebanese and Syrian railroad network and link it onto the Gulf system? Why not? Yeah. Does that make me 8th of March? I don't know. No. Does that just make me rational? So why not, why, why not use this opportunity to rebuild? So this is all about knowledge. Okay, first thing you're going to have to do then before you uh, go and get, demonstrate is you're going to let's go talk to the government officials. Let's go talk to the ministers. Let's go talk to the business leaders. They won't, let's go talk to the people who stole the government property with our good arguments. They're not going to listen. That's often what Martin Luther King experienced. They're not listening to arguments. What do you gain from this dialogue, from this negotiations, besides finding out that they're not listening? You hear their position. You'll know how they think. You should be open when you dialogue with them because what, normally they're going to be relatively open with their arguments against this and sometimes you can use uh, files to find out who actually, sometimes it's government officials who actually are the indirect owners of a lot of the stolen land. So there's another reason why they don't want to do it. Before we go out and fight, go out and burn tires, if you will, what's the third step? according to Martin Luther King. Self-purification. This is, this is one of the major weaknesses of civil society in general. When people go out and fight the good fight, whatever that is in their book, they often mix things. Self-purification is when we go out and fight for the railroads, we, sh we should only be fighting for the railroads, and may mainly the, the general agenda of sustainable development but you shouldn't mix in other emotions like, I'm angry at the government. If I'm also angry at my parents, and angry at my professor, and angry at the priest or sheikh who I don't like, and blah, blah, blah. If I mix that in, will that make me even more angry? Will that make me even more dynamic, and even more of a fighter? Will that make me more focused or less focused? Less focused. You have more energy now, but it's less focused. We know how, what, what does a laser do? It focuses light. The more you spread out the, fo the focus, the less effective you are. So, third step is self-purification and then, go, and then go burn tires. Okay, see you on Tuesday.